be in a couple of different places tonight. It's not a typical Bible study, but I do want to talk uh, tonight, uh, being the first Sunday of December, Christmas season. Um, I want to address a couple of issues regarding Christmas, and uh, it's been a, uh, sometimes uh, in the past I've, I've done this message um, uh, around this time of year because uh, I don't know about you, but inevitably I'll run into somebody that says all oh, Christians should not celebrate Christmas, and um, and they'll give a lot of different reasons, and I want to I want to unpack a couple of those uh, arguments. Um, and, uh, and hopefully it'll give you uh, a couple of things. One, some ammunition, uh, but also on the other side, some, some confidence that you know, this is okay. It's a enjoyable tra- tra- tradition that we can have as our, in our families and, and the memories that are made and those kinds of things uh, without feeling even a guilty conscience or that questionableness like, is this okay? Um, and, uh, and so we'll uh, look into this a little bit um, uh, this evening. I also want to have a good balance when we consider these issues that when you run into people that maybe have a strong conviction about things that you may not, that, uh, that once you've studied it, once you've looked into it, you come to the conclusion that, you know what, I believe we do have liberty in this area and I'm not violating any principles, I'm not violating my conscience. Uh, we also do need to be very mindful and be careful not to be a stumbling block. And uh, that really is the bigger issue uh, when we look at this. But, um, but I hope this will be an encouragement tonight. Uh, um, the Bible tells us uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, when you turn there, I'll, I'll reference a few verses tonight. Um, but in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, the Bible says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, those traditions that Paul is referencing in, to the Thessalonians, they're more uh, biblical commands that Paul has laid out for them. But, uh, but I, I wanted to bring that out uh, uh, because I, I want to say this, not all traditions are bad. I think sometimes when we start talking about traditions, we like to quote Jesus when he talks about uh, the traditions of men, or, uh, you know, Peter talked about, you know, we're not saved by the traditions of our fathers that are passed down, um, or silver and gold, or, or vain traditions, and those kinds of things. And, and uh, when we talk about them, I want to make sure that we're clear that there is no tradition that will save you, okay? We're not saved by any tradition, any ritual, anything like that, right? But the pl- precious blood of Jesus Christ. However, there are some good traditions we have. I'll tell you one good tradition we have, we're doing right now. All right, we're having a Sunday evening church service. Now, uh, are you going to hell if you don't have a Sunday evening church service? Absolutely not. We're not talking about saved or lost, right? We're not talking about those kind of things. But I'll tell you what, it is a healthy tradition to assemble with believers and grow in your faith, all right? Um, Does the Bible tell us what part of the church service we should pass the offering plate? No. What it tells us is we should on the first day of the week. And so, so, you know, uh, by the way, it doesn't tell us whether to pass the offering plate or have a collection box or to give online. Jesus didn't talk about giving online. I don't know if you know that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, however, what we'll do when it comes to giving is we'll come up with a tradition. And here's how we typically will do it, right? Um, and anyways, uh, all I'm saying is there are traditions that are healthy. They're not necessarily biblical or unbiblical, and, uh, and we need to be careful. We, we ought not to get so caught up in traditions. Jesus warned about traditions in uh, Mark 7, 8, and Colossians 2, 8 talks about vain traditions and uh, so, far, uh, so forth. But not all traditions are bad uh, is the point that, I, that I'm making here. And so we can get caught up in debating uh, many times the smallest details. And I love people that say, there's no possible way Jesus would have been born in December, and so therefore it's pagan to celebrate the birth of Christ in December. And, well, it's a leap to say because he wasn't born in December or December 25th, then it's pagan to celebrate December 25th. But I'm going to address that point in just a second. But, again, we love to debate. Now, I will say this. As a Baptist... <laughs> I tend to find problems with just about everything that's out there, okay? <laughs> because, you know, I, I want to know what's behind this and what, what, what is there. And there are some things that might, might cause con- some concern and raise some, some, some red flags. And, and I would say, study them out. Follow where that leads, okay? We did a, a message on, on Halloween and, and, uh, and a lot of the, the occult and uh, even demonic practices that take place on, on that wicked day. And, and we, we ought to dive into that and see what that's all about. Um, it is amazing that, uh, that well, I'm not going to go down that one again and rehash that, but, uh, but, but we want to be careful that we get, don't get so caught up in maybe the little details of things. You know, first Peter, first uh, Timothy one, four talks about, 
um, basically debating about endless genealogies and, and things that only, uh, only bring about strife and contention. And uh, we can get so caught up in that, right, uh, debating about, you know, whether or not Adam and Eve had a belly button, okay? At the end of the day, who cares, okay? <laughs> uh, there are some things that are very important that we ought to be very strong on. You know, I'm not going to budge on, on, the, on the, the gospel message and, uh, and, and Christ being the propitiation and the only way of salvation and those kinds of things. I'm not going to budge on that. But, you know, there are other things that, that, quite frankly, I've even shared with you some things that, that you know what? Uh, the Bible doesn't speak clearly to this, but based on this and this, I've come to this conclusion. I'll share that with you, right? And I'll explain that the Bible's not dogmatic on this, so I can't be, but here's why I believe such and such, right? And uh, so we got to be careful. We got to be, uh, in a sense, flexible. And, um, and, and again, not every practice that we do, and I want to be careful how I say this, isn't necessarily like biblical or unbiblical. Does that make sense? Um, There are traditions that I enjoy doing. Uh, for example, you know, we were for a while, we were overdue for one, I think, but uh, Brother Mara, we were having, you know, inspiration nights, right? That's a blessing. That's an enjoyable event that we can have. And is it biblical? Is it unbiblical? No. You see, but, but it's, a, it's a Christian exercise we can have. Now, there's definitely plenty of scripture we can say that that accomplished. As we edified one another, as we worshiped God and praised the Lord, saying praises together within the congregation. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can look at and say, well, but is that the only way to do it? No, but that's one way. And, and all I'm saying is there's a lot of good things out there. And so uh, I want to say this, that it really doesn't matter when Jesus was born, but that he was born. Amen. That he was born. And it was a miraculous birth, and it was, uh, he came in the right time, in due time, the Bible tells us, um, um, and so forth, but that he came. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost, the greatest gift mankind could ever receive. He, he came as that, that gift was a redeemer, Isaiah 59, 20. The redeemer would come. He is the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 2, 2. Um, and there is much to celebrate in remembering that great day. And again, not necessarily December 25th, but, but I, I want to say this. You ought to just, if we're going to do it, we ought to pick a day and celebrate it, right? Um, you know, so let's start a new tradition. We're going to all celebrate it, you know, uh, uh, May 27th. <laughs> and then I'm sure someone would have a problem with that, right? Uh, but, but all I'm saying is that, that uh, this is something worth remembering. Um, the gospel ought to be our focus. The death, burial, and the resurrection, according to the scriptures. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've challenged this before. You know, we hear a lot around this time of year, Jesus is the reason for the season. And to that, we ought to say amen. But the follow-up challenge is this, but what was the reason for Jesus? And Jesus is the reason for this season, but what is the reason for Jesus? And boy, you have your entrance to the gospel now. You get to share why he came. You get to share what his name means. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means Jehovah saves. And um, actually, it's the same word for, uh, uh, in Hebrew, um, uh, Yeshua, the book of Joshua. And what was Joshua? He was the one leading, uh, leading the children of Israel into the promised land, uh, so to speak. And there's a lot of typology there, but, but that's who Jesus was, that Jehovah will save. And I think about even in the book of Joshua, how, how what happened? Who won the battle of Jericho? <laughs> Correct. God did. Israel did not win. God won. Right? Who was winning those battles? Jehovah saves. Right? And, uh, and so, so what is Jesus? Jesus is our God saving us. Amen? And, uh, and so great opportunity to kind of unpack those. Throughout the Old Testament, whenever God would do something noteworthy, um, or very often when God would do something very noteworthy, he would say, hey, I want you guys to set up a memorial right here. Right? They crossed the river of the Jordan River, as they started to go into the Promised Land, he said, before we move on, uh, we ought to set up some stones on this river uh, bank, but also in the middle of the river. And, uh, and, uh, and set up these stones, one stone for each tribe, and, and when your sons come along and they say, what meaneth these stones? You get to say, what great things the Lord hath done. And uh, these were memorials, these were opportunities to share with the children what God had done. And many times, I think that that's why, you know, uh, when they, they began after... After they came out of Egypt, and God started instituting some things, and he said, he said remember when you were in Egypt, and uh, that last plague, and that angel of death would come through 
uh, the whole nation. But everyone who had the blood on the doorpost, that angel of death would pass over them. And he said, so from now on, as a, as a, as a memorial, I want you guys to celebrate the feast of the Passover. And in the same manner, that, that lamb, that, that blood was shed, I want you to eat a lamb. And I want you to have all the, uh, you know, the symbolism of this angel of death passing over, pro, uh, projecting or, or, or foreshadowing, if you would, the Messiah that would come and all that would put their faith in that blood would pass, the de death angel, if you would, or the judgment of God would pass over you. And so what, they were do what were they doing? They were doing a memorial. Today, we even have some memorials, right? We th I think about... Uh, um, I think about when somebody gets saved, one of the very first things they do is a public display of what God has done is a visual memorial for everybody who's there and says, I have identified myself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ through salvation. So what do they do? They're plunged in the, in the water, right? We as a church will practice um, the Lord's table. What is that? That is a memorial. It's twofold. Remembering his death and remembering that he comes again, Right? Uh, this you'll do in this you'll show the Lord's death until He comes, right? So it's twofold. It's it's looking back, but we're also looking forward. And so over and over again, we have these memorials and uh, that God would set up. And and I think Christmas is no different. Around this time of year, a good Christian family should be focusing. Remember what God did, and even as we sang, "O come, O come, Emmanuel, God with us." and ransom captivity of Israel, uh, the years of prophecies and waiting and waiting, and then 400 years of what we call the silent years, the intertestament time period when there was no prophecy and there was nothing going on, and they're just waiting from Malachi to Matthew. Then suddenly, um, after 400 years and four different captivities, uh, God shows up, and he gives a virgin girl Messiah through her womb. And boy, you know, at that time of year, we talk about Mary and her perspective. We may talk about Joseph and his perspective. But just, man, put, your, put your, your, your place, yourself in Mary's shoes, so to speak, her sandals. And, and think, you know, this angel just showing up. Surprise, Mary. <laughs> I know you've, you've kept yourself and you've been pure and you've been waiting and now you're pregnant. And she's espoused to Joseph. How am I going to explain this to him? Is he going to believe me? Who about all these people? Are they going to believe me? And all this, all this stuff that they're dealing with. And all I'm saying is it's an amazing time of year to, to focus on this miracle, the miracle of the virgin birth, which I believe, by the way, is one of the fundamentals of the faith. So we ought to give some time to it. We ought to give some attention to it, right? Around the time of the resurrection, we give extra attention to the miracle of the resurrection, which is a fundamental of the faith. Could you be saved without believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I contend no. That is part of the gospel message, right? And so we bring that up, especially certain times of year. We ought to bring it up many times throughout the year. By the way, around this time of year is not the only time I reference the virgin birth. There are times of year where we dive into some doctrine and, and we get into the doctrine of uh, salvation and, and, and discuss the virgin birth and necessity of them. But in regards to observing holy days, where we get the word holiday, um, and uh, in regards to eating certain foods and so forth, Paul addresses these areas of liberty that we have. And in Romans 14, I've mentioned this uh, many times, but it says, Romans 14, verse 5 and 6, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth uh, not the day, to the Lord doth he regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. He that giveth thanks, or excuse me, for he giveth thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth thanks. I've been through some seasons where I eat not and give thanks. Those are a little bit harder seasons than the seasons I eat and give thanks. Uh, but the point he's making there is this, that there are those that are abstaining maybe from meats, and, uh, but he's doing it to the Lord. And in his conscience, in his, in his heart, heart of hearts, he's honoring God through this thing. Let him do that. And because it's between him and God and, and this other guy, same, same thing. Some guys are esteeming some days. By the way, there are some Christians out there, some believers, that really get into some of these uh, Jewish traditional um, uh, feasts and, and holy days. And, uh, and, and my only caution would be, make sure you're not, you're not tying that to your righteousness. But when you look at those things, they all point to Jesus Christ. 
And some of those can be actually some enjoyable things. We, uh, a few of you in here, um, we've had uh, uh, a Jewish Baptist preacher uh, uh, come in and, tell, and walk us through a Passover meal and talk about all the pictures and the types in it. That is very enjoyable. I don't do it because I have to do it or been commanded to do it, but it sure was enjoyable, and, and it really connected a lot, tied a lot of things together. I thought, this is really uh, helpful, and it made me really appreciate the Lord. And, and even... Um, various aspects of, of the, the pictures and typology. And so, so what I'm saying is uh, there are certain things that people may really have strong opinions on, and we need to allow each other some liberty. And, and it goes on in Romans 14 about, about not being a stumbling block, and especially when you talk about the meats. Like, I, I cannot violate my conscience and eat certain meats, right? Maybe, I've, maybe I grew up in a very rigid Jewish home and got saved later on. And I realized, wait a minute, I can eat whatever I want. Some get real excited about that. Others, every time I go and try to have pork chops, I'm just, I'm just convicted, right? Now, is it a sin to eat pork chops? Not at all. But in his conscience, he just can't get past that at this point. So you don't go and chide him and say, oh, you just, you're, you're, you're a legalist or you're under the law. Christ has saved you from all that. You know, you don't beat him up over it. You allow him that liberty. You say, you know what, when we have you over for dinner, we're not having that. We're going we're gonna to have some tri-tip, okay? And uh, by the way, a lot of Jews like to have the tri-tip with the Passover meal. That's one of the things they go to. Uh, um, uh, no, uh, not tri-tip, uh, that's the other, um, I can't remember, um, the other fun steak. But tri-tip too, that's really good. But anyways, um, <laughs> I remember we had, uh, we had this uh, preacher uh, in our church from, um, uh, from India, and uh, and he said, you know, he saved and everything. And he said, you know, in India, they don't eat steak. Uh, they believe cows, you know, were their, their reincarnation of, uh, of their ancestors and went on. They actually, to the point of worship, the cows. And uh, so the cows run free in the streets and all that kind of stuff. And he, he came and he was talking to us. And he says, you know what? He says, one of the great parts of being a Christian, he says, is steak. <laughs> he said, I love steak. He's like, I can eat steak all day. And he's so excited about steak. And he loved, he loved spicy food. We took him to this Mexican restaurant. He just, he loved food. Every time he comes to the States, he just kind of swells up and then goes back home and shrinks it, you know, sweats it off. But, uh, <laughs> um, but he's talking about how much he loves steak and liberty he had in Christ. But, uh, but anyways, I'm getting off track. But you know, when we look at all this, I would like to point out just a couple of things when we talk about Christmas traditions. And uh, so I want to address this. Um, and the uh, first thing I want to address, one of the objections about we're, uh, celebrating Christmas is, um, well, Jesus could not possibly have been born on December 25th, okay? And there are people um, who do not, uh, um, or th there are people to whom the, the celebration of Christmas or not celebrating, really is a big deal. They make a huge deal about it. And, um, and I don't believe this is an issue we ought to break fellowship over. It's not a fundamental of the faith, okay? And if you have a friend that uh, says, well, I don't, do, I don't do any decorations and I don't celebrate Christmas, uh, that's fine. Don't break fellowship over that, okay? Is this uh, not working, Jaden? Is this, is this working okay? Okay, all right. I felt like you got quiet when I walked away. Um, but I, I do think it's also not an issue that we have to be confused about or ignorant about. I think a careful study of comparing Scripture with Scripture, we could arrive to a conclusion, not necessarily based on someone's opinion, but based on the Word of God, uh, about the matter. And so the common teaching, a couple of things I want to bring up about uh, some common teachings uh, in regards to, uh, to, to objection of celebrating Christmas. Um, uh, the common teaching is that we really can't have any, we have no idea about when Jesus was born, or uh, sometimes there's, um, uh, there's other teachings that, you know, or that, that would bring to the conclusion of we shouldn't celebrate on that day because we have no idea when Jesus was born. Um, some people uh, uh, promote that the belief, uh, uh, some people that promote that or say, say that you shouldn't celebrate Christmas say that December 25th was just adopted from a pagan holiday and um, uh, with a veneer of Christianity as a covering, so to speak, and, and um, and the teaching has this, you know, it has some basis in historical fact. In fact, uh, uh, if, you, if you look at a lot of, especially Catholic traditions, a lot of them were rooted in pagan practice. Um, and, uh, but I want to say this, as we consider celebrating Christmas, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we as believers are celebrating? Are we actually diving into the Druid uh, or, uh, tradition or practice that did celebrate something on December 25th or around winter solstice? Are we actually 
uh, be uh, engaging in something that was near that. You know, for example, I, uh, my birthday, just so you all know this, is uh, March 17th. Anybody know what day March 17th is? St. Patrick's Day, right? Now listen, on St. Patrick's Day, there is a lot of drunkenness that goes on. So in reality, I should not celebrate my birthday. Because after all, that'd be adopting this alcoholic holiday. So how dare I celebrate my birthday on December 7th, or on December 25th, uh, on, on March 17th? You see what I'm saying? There are multiple things that can land on the same day. And uh, if, we, if we kind of canceled things out based on that, you know, um, uh, you know, here's one. What if your birthday was on uh, April 20th? That's Adolf Hitler's birthday. <laughs> I'm not going to celebrate. My wife actually had tests induced because her due date was April 1st. And knowing who her father was, he was not, she was not going to put her through that, so she had her induced on December, uh, or, sorry, March uh, 31st. And so I'm always telling Tess now, it's like, your real birthday is April 1st. And uh, but anyways, <laughs> um, but, but, but I, I want to just get into this real quick. So the common teaching, uh, again, may have some bias in historical fact, but, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of things um, in regards to, I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but Emperor Constantine, when basically the birth of the Catholic Church, he kind of married paganism with Christianity. And there were a lot of things that kind of blended and blurred the lines a little bit. Um, and so I'll kind of get back to the, the date in just a second. Uh, but here's one that, that's, uh, that's always brought up as an objection. Christmas trees and decorations are forbidden by Scripture. Christmas trees and decorations. And can you believe it? Some churches put up Christmas trees in their sanctuary. Can you believe it? That's forbidden. It's clearly forbidden in Scripture. And let me show you the verse. Share, share with you the verse. Jeremiah 10, verse number 3. For the customs of the people are vain. One cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of his hands of the workmen with an axe, and deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. That sounds like a Christmas tree. Hmm. Is God forbidding the cutting down of trees and decorating them? Interesting question. They say the passage is referring to the custom of putting up uh, Christmas trees and decorating them. However, the verses surrounding verse 3 and 4 are the context. And what they're talking about is they're talking about idols made from trees. And the prophet is saying, since they can't speak, they can't move, they've got no power, you don't need to be afraid of them. And that's what he says in verse number 5. He's like, you don't need to fear these things. There's a tree that was cut down and decorated. And, you know, and he's like, you don't need to be afraid of that. Eyes they see not, mouths they speak not. That, it's an idol. What God's forbidding is fearing idols. Who should we fear? We should fear God, not some, not some idol made with hands. By the way, if you have to make your God, that's not a God, okay? You made it. That's why I get a kick out of Dagon, the, 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 the Philistines, when, when their, their God kept falling over when they had the ark with it. They weren't playing well together, and they had to go prop their God up. I'm sorry. If you have to prop up your God, I don't, I'll tell you what, I need God to prop me up. If I have to prop God up, that's no God, okay? And that's what Jeremiah is saying. He's like, you guys, you're falling after these things. Remember, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he was warning Israel for their idolatry. And that's what he's pointing out. He's not saying don't have a Christmas tree as a decoration. All right, we've got these little shrubs here. And uh, I think it's a beautiful decoration. When you come forward, when you guys came forward this morning and knelt down at the altar, were you bowing down to these trees? Are we worshiping these trees? Maybe. Are we? Oh, I found out who the person who has a problem with December 25th is. <laughs> these decorations, what are they doing? They're accents, folks. It's winter time, and we like to enjoy. By the way, isn't it awesome we live in a place that grows Christmas trees outside? Like you drive around, and these, they're already decorated. they got beautiful snow on them. When the sun hits it just right, the colors in the wintertime, it's like the pastel. I tell you, I love being here. I know it's cold and it's miserable, but, but boy, it's beautiful. <laughs> It's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful? And you can't deny it, okay? Um, um, and so here's one of the, the, the objections. All right, December 25th was celebrated as a, as a Mithra, Mithraic feast day. Uh, Mithra was a Persian version of the Hindu sun god Mitra. According to the, uh, according to the uh, Zoroastrian religion, 
Uh, Mithra was the god of light, and his feast was celebrated each year on December 25th at the time when Constantine made Christianity the legal religion of Rome. Uh, worship of uh, Mithra was very widespread throughout the empire, particularly among soldiers in the Roman army. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church took the, pag uh, the pagan uh, Zoroastrian holiday and renamed it Christ's Mass. The first recorded celebration of Christmas in, on December 25th in the Roman Empire took place in A.D. 336, 23 years after Christianity became the legal religion. Uh, so there's no question there's some elements in the early Christian celebration that maybe had some pagan roots uh, with it, but the association led many Christians uh, to frown on the celebration of Christmas. In fact, in the early days, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, there was a fine of five shillings that was imposed on anybody that found following the popish uh, tradition of celebrating Christmas. But, uh, but in regards to celebrating Christmas and the timing of Christ's birth, I believe there's much to be gained by studying history and studying Scripture. Uh, an honest conclusion uh, from such a study, I think, will be in contrast to what some people teach when, they, when they're unpacking these things. And so the uh, first thing I want to look at is this thing of the Christmas tree. Uh, the Christmas tree actually has Christian origins. Um, uh, Dr. John R. Rice, in his sermon, Should a Christian Observe Christmas, uh, which was uh, in a book, Great Preaching on Christmas, he uh, recounts the story of the origin of the Christmas tree. In the 8th century, a missionary named uh, Boniface went to Germany to preach Christ. The Germanic tribes worshipped the oak tree. They thought of it as a symbol of deity. Uh, but but uh, Boniface, uh, or Boniface um, told them that the oak tree was a poor symbol for God. It sheds its leaves and appears to die each winter. The tree that should remind them of God, he said, was the evergreen. It is always green and thriving. And the Christmas tree became popular then in England, primarily through the influence of the German-born Prince Albert, husband of uh, Elizabeth's queen, Victoria. In America, they were introduced by the Dutch or the German uh, imma, uh, the, um, immigrants to Pennsylvania because the Christmas tree... Uh, uh, so, so, so I'm kind of summarizing things really quickly, but, but, uh, but basically it was, it, was, it was representing, if you want to have a representative, if you want to kind of see something that, that, that reminds you of that, uh, pick something like the evergreen tree, it's similar to, to, um, to kind of Paul when he was saying, you know, here's an un, un, um, tomb to the unknown God, let's talk about that, all right? Uh, let's talk about who, who this could be pointing to and who could be representing um, uh, but the reality is it, it really is a decoration. It is something to, to uh, if you would, uh, that could remind us not only that evergreen, the thriving aspect of God, Christ and the Christian life, think about the lights that we can put on it as we are the light of the world and, uh, and so forth. Um, all I'm saying is I don't think we can necessarily just say, well, we shouldn't have Christmas trees. You know, I will say this, don't worship your Christmas tree. Right? Don't worship your Christmas tree. Okay? Um, you know, I almost, uh, those of you who came to our house uh, during the Christmas party or in recent days, we have our Christmas tree in a different place this year. It's in the middle of our living room. And I almost had a hard time because it's like kind of front and center. In the past, we've had it kind of off in the corner. And I was like, I, I hope people don't kind of get the idea that I'm kind of like putting, making a shrine out of this tree, you know, this massive tree. But it's a fun decoration, right? It's something that just this time of year uh, we go through. And I don't know about you, but when I put the ornaments on and everything, they all have stories. And it's an annual memory, like, oh, I remember that one, I remember that one, and, and, uh, and different things that we've put on it. And I was even telling some of the stories uh, to some of the folks at the Christmas party. Oh, this one was, you know, when we got married and went on our honeymoon, and this was Sadie's first Christmas, and this was, you know, kind of going down the list. And, and, um, and it definitely can be a very enjoyable time. Um, here's, here's one that I want to get to. The Bible does not rule out December as the month when Christ was born. Now, a lot of people will say December po couldn't possibly be the month when Christ was born. Um, and, uh, and I want to give you some scripture that, that I think we can't rule it out. Um, it is true that the scripture, uh, Bible does not give us the, the exact date of the birth of Christ, but through careful study, I think we can uh, come very close to the traditional date of December 25th. Um, so a couple of things, and you might want to jot this down so you can look it up later and feel free to. Um, the Hebrew religious year begins in the month Nisan. The Hebrew calendar has 354 days instead of 365 days, so the calendars do not exactly line up um, the, with the one that we use. The Hebrew month Nisan roughly corresponds with mid-April, uh, mid-March to mid-April on our calendar. This is the month celebrated when the Passover uh, and Israel's deliverance from Egypt, the first month of the Hebrew religious year, is the month Nisan. 
Uh, next, next point. The priests who served in the temple served after the pattern established by King David, according to 1 Chronicles 24. Uh, the descendants of Aaron were divided by David into 24 groups to serve in two roles. Uh, first as governors of the sanctuary and as governors of the house of God. That's 1 Chronicles 24.5. Each group of priests served according to the schedule drawn up by casting lots. That's uh, verse 7 through 18. It would seem that from uh, 2 Chronicles 23.8 that the priests served for a week at a time and this meant that each group knew when they were due to leave their homes and go to Jerusalem for their time of service. Each would serve twice a year along with the, uh, the mandatory feasts of Passover, First Fruits, Tabernacles, when all, ser- uh, when all the priests served. This would complete each year of their calendar. So, so it's kind of like the National Guard. You know, you got your, your one week in a month and two weeks a year. Uh, they, they would go down to Jerusalem for their week of service, and they would go down to Jerusalem for, the, for those major feasts, Okay. Now, we get to Luke 1, and we're introduced to a character by the name of Zacharias. That is the father of John the Baptist. Now, it's really interesting the details that God gives us of, John, uh, or of Zacharias. Um, almost seems like kind of unnecessary extra details. And he kind of throws some details at us. And in uh, Luke 1, verse 5, it says, There were in the days of Herod, Herod the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, or Abijah, and his wife was the, uh, the daughter of, uh, of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, what's interesting is Abijah is of the sons of Aaron, and his wife was also of the daughters of Aaron, and, um, and so he was of the, uh, not just of a Levi, but of the Aaronic priest line, okay? Now, according to First Chronicles 24.10, the family of Abijah was assigned the eighth course, and, uh, and that meant that Abijah and his descendants after him would fulfill their duty to serve on the 8th and the 32nd turns. I'm sorry, I said they serve one week a year. It is two weeks of the year. So his family was the 9th and the 23rd week of the year. So as a descendant of Abijah, Zacharias would have served in the temple those two weeks of the, of the Hebrew calendar. They would fall in the springtime and in the autumn time on our calendar. Zacharias was fulfilling his normal term of service when the angel Gabriel appeared and told him, and that, uh, that he and Elizabeth were going to have a son. It was during that second, um, if it was during the second rotation of the year, Zechariah would have completed his service in the fall time. The Bible tells us that Zechariah stayed and completed his normal duties in the temple before returning home in Luke uh, 1.23. It was probably shortly after his return that Elizabeth conceived as promised by the angel, and the date of the conception of John the Baptist in this case would have been the end of October. We're told that Elizabeth hid herself five months after conceiving John in uh, Luke 1, 24. So if you're following so far, uh, there's two courses, the springtime and the fall time that Zechariah would have landed on. If, we're just doing an if scenario, if it landed on the second, uh, the second duty, which would have been the fall time, when he came home, uh, his wife Elizabeth would have conceived around October. Uh, then she hid herself for five months. Gabriel then appears to Mary the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy to announce the birth of Christ. The start of the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy would have been probably early spring. It was at that time that Gabriel announced to Mary that she would be the mother of the Messiah. He also told her that her cousin Elizabeth was pregnant. That's verse 26 through 36. So here we are six months later, the springtime, they find out when Mary is, uh, is uh, with child, right? Now, the normal gestation time period of a human, of a woman, is nine months. So if Mary conceived in, uh, or, or, or was found with a child in the springtime, nine months later brings her right around to, anyone do the math? The end of December, okay? And, um, and so, uh, so just based on that time period, it could have been then or six months earlier. Okay, but uh, what I'm saying is you can't rule it out if you follow the timeline of these details. By the way, these details are fascinating when you kind of look at why did God give this detail and this detail? Why was that plugged in there? You can kind of put timelines together and charts and all those kinds of things. Now, one of the objections is, well, if it was wintertime, there would not have been shepherds in the field. Did you know, uh, by the way, which hemisphere is Jerusalem in? Northern hemisphere. Okay, that's the same hemisphere as us, right? What season is December in the Northern Hemisphere? Winter. 
All right. And by the way, it gets cold in there. It doesn't get Alaska cold, but it gets cold there. It does snow there in Jerusalem. And, uh, and it can get pretty chilly, all right? Not a lot of mountains to block wind and, and those kinds of things. And um, so a lot of, some of the arguments is, well, there wouldn't be shepherds in the field. And some have objected that it, could, it couldn't be possibly wintertime because of that. However, there was a field between Bethlehem and Jerusalem, which wasn't very far apart, Bethlehem and Jerusalem, which was, called, uh, um, um, which was uh, uh, the location of what was called the Tower of the Flock, which is mentioned in, in Micah 4.8. Shepherds kept the spotless lamps chosen for temple sacrifice year-round there. And, uh, and by the way, since the verse comes just seven verses before the Messianic prophecy of where the Messiah would be born, uh, some believe that it was a prophecy of the announcement that would be made about this, um, uh, the, the, the flock there. In fact, let me go ahead and turn there. I want you guys to see this in Micah 4. Sometimes it's just boring Bible study here. But uh, in Micah 4, look at Micah 4. Uh, excuse me for nerding out tonight. Look at Micah 4, verse number 8. It says, O thou tower of the flock. That was a specific location, tower. That was, again, between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Um, and thou tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come. And even the, the first dominion, the kingdom, shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. So unto thee shall it first come. What is, it, what is a first coming? Some kind of uh, awareness, some kind of something is going to come first in this place. Just a few verses later, look at Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old of everlasting. Now, who, who is that prophecy about? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? And what's it prophesying? Where he's going to be born, right? Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, right? Called the house of what? House of bread, right? And that was a pop quiz there. Good job, Ryan. Um, house of bread. And so here we are. This, this, it's going to be first told. Something's going to be first told at this tower of flock. He who is going to be a ruler is going to be coming to Bethlehem. And so some have connected that, that those are kind of the two things. So... Uh, so it's interesting is that there is, uh, there is an area where they keep the flock year-round. And what's interesting is there actually is a tower there that's raised so that they can keep warm while the sheep are out there and still be able to keep an eye on the flock while, while they're, they're grazing. And so that was kind of part of what that tower was. But um, um, I have a whole message on, on just the, the, the shepherds. It's really quite fascinating as God... Uh, uh, the angels appear to shepherds of all people and how shepherds, they were not allowed into the temple and they were not allowed even into the synagogue because they're unclean for being with the sheep all the time, even though they're the ones that would handle the sacrificial lambs. And yet God brings an angelic announcement to the angels, uh, I'm sorry, to the shepherds. And he tells the shepherds, You'll, uh, this will be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in what? Swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And uh, the swaddling clothes, what was a swaddling clothes? Those were the, the rags and, and the, the receiving cloth that they would use with those sacrificial lambs. This made sense. The, the, the picture and the typology all kind of came together. And they were the ones to go. They were not allowed into the synagogue. They were not allowed into the temple. They go to where Jesus is. And what do they do? They find him there. And uh, the lamb, the final lamb, who would take away the sins of the world. As they're out there in the field watching over the spotless lambs, they find the final spotless lamb wrapped in swaddling clothes in, quite frankly, undesirable location. I'll tell you what, you talk about unclean. He was born in a stable, lying in a manger, a feeding trough. Uh, I tell you what, that's, uh, that's pretty phenomenal. But really... When we, when we consider these things, all I want to say is this, that we really can't rule out uh, even December 25th if, if that's going to be our basis. I'm just going to say, if that's going to be our basis for not celebrating Christmas or celebrating Christmas this time of year. Um, so we, we see, you know, the testimony of, of historical accounts. We've seen even scripture um, that, that possibly could be around this time. There are some people who honestly object to celebrating Christian, uh, excuse me, Christmas, but it's not legitimate 
ba- uh, on the basis that Jesus could not have been born at that time. Now, certainly there are things associated with Christmas, especially here in America, that ought to be a concern to all of us. Um, uh, covetousness, right? Uh, especially with our children, making sure, you know, we're talking about presents and, and uh, you know, as parents, you know, we're, they're, they're expressions of love. We want to show our love and we want to give them a present. We want to see their faces light up. But we also want to be careful that, uh, that it's not all about greed and covetousness, you know. I always enjoy families that they, they try to find some sort of tradition that they include in their Christmas tradition where they're going to give to needy or they're going to do something for others. And, and um, uh, uh, there's a, there's a cr- cute Christmas movie that, our, that we started watching uh, where they, I can't remember the name of it, but they'll go and, uh, what do they call it, the elf people. And they'll, they'll show up and they'll, they'll put a present on someone's door and knock and, and go and hide. And, uh, and it's like, you know, uh, they're doing this to like this poor family and the kids pick on their kids and they, they kind of were showing this selfless love of just elfing them <laughs> and, um, and bring us to their house. Um, but to something where they are learning the lesson that it truly is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, I'll say this. I got in trouble one time for saying this next one uh, it, it, with, that, with having the children in. The children have been dismissed. But, um, but here's one. Um, Santa Claus. Uh, I will say this. You know, and by the way, it's not sinful in and of itself to tell, you know, Santa Claus and all this stuff. I've taught my children that Santa Claus is, is like Mickey Mouse. I mean, it's just a fictitious character. It's fun, you know, but there's no Santa Claus, right? I said that in a church one time, and a mother gasped, oh, are my kids in this service? And I'm like, really? But let me just say this. Let me th- say this. Some of these things, if we're lying to our children, and they grow up, you know, and eventually they're going to figure out, oh, Santa's not real and all that stuff. Um, I remember, <laughs> I remember we watched the movie The Santa Claus with Tim Allen. And Sadie started coming to me, and she's like, are you sure there's no Santa? Is there, is there a possibility? Like, she loved the idea so much, and uh, she always knew that Santa was fake. But uh, she'd be like, sorry, Sadie, I didn't realize you were back there. Uh, <laughs> I was looking first, and I didn't see you back there. I didn't want to embarrass you. I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but let me just say this. When they grow up and get older, and they're hearing about Jesus and all this stuff, could Jesus be, you know, like Santa? Maybe it's just a make-believe thing that sounds nice. See what I'm saying? Or how about this? I'm the one that sacrificed for those presents. I don't want to give credit to a stranger. <laughs> you see? Um, but anyways, that's just a kind of a caution, you know, about getting in the habit of, you know, lying to your children. Um, I just want to, you know, I ought to be careful about those kinds of things, you know. I've never told them that there's a tooth fairy, that there's a Santa Claus, you know. We, you know, if those kinds of things come up, you know, it's a fun game. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretend game, you know, kind of a thing. But anyways, that's just uh, me and some, some advice there. Um, when we consider some of these things, you know, there are some consequences of, of kind of what's, what's uh, being taught. Understanding the truth of Christ's birth from a careful study of God's word, rather than just uh, accepting traditions and whatnot, uh, what others say is important. Um, you know, we find uh, when we, we study, we, when we study, we actually find the truth about Christmas. Like, what's, what really are we studying? What really are we uh, uh, involved in and worshiping and recognizing? Um, but I think, uh, I think really one of the fascinating things when we consider this is, is the Bible always adds up. You know, you approach things and you look at things, uh, there's always going to be uh, the scriptures are going to give you the answer and figure out. It, some things may take a little more careful study than others and, and putting dates together and timelines and those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it does add up. It's fascinating that uh, you can take the Bible. Um, uh, I can take what the Bible gives me and arrive to logical conclusions. Even if people haven't been celebrating Christ's birth as December 25th for all these years, we could still have the, you know, the shepherds in the fields and their lambs and the calendar um, calculations of Zechariah and everything. We could actually establish that, you know, it's pretty close to that time period. You know, there are, and again, to, to rule it out just because, well, there's, there's pagan, you know, things. There's all kinds of pagan practices that are around winter solstice, summer solstice. Um, we looked at... Um, uh, um, well, yeah, I mean, there's just different, different times of year and whatnot. And all I'm saying, you know, just because there's a coincidence, 
uh, doesn't necessarily mean we're not celebrating those pagan practices. We are celebrating the one true God taking on flesh, coming into this world to die for our sins. Uh, there's nothing pagan about that. That is, that is the truth. That is the gospel, uh, a major part of the gospel. And so, um, but, you know, what's amazing is you can study the Bible for 10 hours a day for the rest of your life and honestly never run out of things to learn. That's what's so awesome about the scriptures. Um, if you find something doesn't seem to add up, it's always your adding. It's not the Bible. <laughs> uh, it's my problem with math. Um, but um, if you don't see how something in the Bible could be true, don't assume that the Bible's wrong because it isn't. Be patient. Be attentive. Eventually, somebody's going to figure out, you know, <laughs> what's going on. Skeptics used to criticize the Bible account of the birth of Christ because Luke talked about it being when uh, Cyrenius was the governor of Syria. Uh, they said Cyrenius was, was, uh, wasn't governor until years later. Then they dug a little deeper in the ar archaeological record. They found out that twice Cyrenius had been governor of Syria. The first time he was governor when Christ was born, and the second time was later. Um, I have yet to see any published articles, by the way, or national news journals or anything like that saying, oops, we were wrong. Uh, apparently uh, the Bible was true. And, folks, that happens over and over again. They'll say, well, there's no evidence of this group that's mentioned in the Bible. And then, and then they do some digging. Oh, there they are. <laughs> you know, or, or like when you saw the, the Moses controversy video while I was out of town. You know, they're saying, well, there's no evidence of Nineveh because it didn't line up with the timeline. There is this catastrophe that happened in, in um, not Nineveh, um, the tower, uh, Jericho. Thank you, Jericho. There's no evidence that Jericho was taken down because the timeline didn't match up. But there is evidence that Jericho uh, had uh, some kind of catastrophe that took place at some point, but it couldn't possibly have been the Exodus because of the timeline. You know, well, maybe your timeline's off, okay? And, uh, but that's how they would look at things, right? Um, but you never ha hear like these apologies and whatnot because they want so badly the Bible to be wrong. But um, the reality is the Bible has much more to tell us than what we have learned. And that's one of the points I want to take away. When we kind of look at these things, we love to just draw hard-line conclusions. And, well, well, this, I'm standing on this. And, well, are you willing to change if the Bible says otherwise? Are you willing to adjust? And, but the reality is the Bible does have much more to tell us. Have you ever thought this way? You know, I've read the Bible so much, there's really nothing new for me to learn. Anybody have that thought? If you do, that's wrong. Uh, you know... <laughs> I've had one guy say this to me once. He said, he said, you know, I've been going to church for so long, I've heard just about every sermon that there is to be heard. I was like, man, I haven't even heard all the sermons that I'm going to preach. Okay? Um, that's such an arrogant position to have. You know? uh, and one guy said, yeah, I did Christianity for about 10 years, read through the Bible about 10 times, and you know, figured out everything I need to know, and I've kind of moved on. I'm like, I don't think you've ever even hit first base. Okay? I don't think you've even started. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, uh, let me move on. But, you know, considering these things, the Bible is worthy of careful study, and that's kind of one of the points I want to bring out. Um, as, you, as you consider things and look at uh, the Scripture, we ought to pay attention to details. We ought to look at some of those things, and sometimes you go through the genealogies, and you're like, oh, this is so boring. I'm falling asleep reading this. You know, sometimes you're going to find really tremendous nuggets in those passages and in those things when you kind of line them up. I believe you ought to read your, your Bible like a person mining for gold. Uh, by the way, don't read your Bible like a novel. Don't, read, don't speed read your Bible. Uh, but look, look f like, like someone mining for gold, you know. Uh, every once in a while, you're going to find that little, you know, glimmer. Like, I'm going to start digging around that, that part that's sparkling. You know, well, what is that? Let's, let's unpack that. And, uh, um, um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, I like what one guy said. I think it was, uh, it was H.A. Ironside. He was once asked, what do you do with all the hard parts of the Bible? He said this, I do the same thing I do when I'm eating fish. I put the bones on the side of the plate for someone else to choke on, and I eat the rest of the fish. You know, there, there's a lot that messes you up, you know, and people have asked that, you know, what do you do with all those hard parts, you know, and, uh, or I'm stuck on this, you know, there's, a, there's enough of the Bible that I understand that'll keep me busy for quite a while, okay? Um, I like what one guy said, he said, uh, he said, you know what I want to do? Uh, this guy was in Chicago, and he said, um, he was a very vulgar and vile guy, and he was, I think it was, uh, I think it was Mark Twain telling this story, and he said, he said, I want to go over to, I want to go uh, get on a plane, I want to go over to a, uh, to Mount Sinai, and I want to climb up to the top of Mount Sinai, and I want to read, uh, read the Ten Commandments out loud on the top of Mount Sinai. And he said to him, he said, I have a better idea. Why don't you stay in Chicago and keep them? 
<laughs> you know, and we, we get caught up on all these other things. You know what? You know, there's enough, uh, there's enough of the Bible that I do understand that's going to keep me troubled than, than the stuff that I don't understand. But, but the reality is it's worthy of our study. Um, and God's timing is perfect. Isn't it interesting that the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world would be born at the same time that the lambs are out in the field being born. Paul said that Jesus was born in Galatians 4.4 when the fullness of time was come, at the right time, at the, at the moment that God had, had planned. See, God's never done anything accidentally. Bethlehem is only a few miles away from Jerusalem. It's very possible that those shepherds to whom the angels announced the birth of Christ were in the same, the same shepherds that kept the sheep in the temple, um, for the temple to provide lambs for the sacrifice. The symbolism that's associated with Christ's birth really is, is quite powerful. You know, we can't always count on God's work. Uh, excuse me, we, we can always count on God's, uh, God to work exactly at the right time, exactly the right way. And one of the things that a careful study does bring is it, is it builds our faith in showing us how God uh, makes everything beautiful in his time, as it says in Ecclesiastes 3.11. And so when you think about the Christmas season, you know, uh, it surely is the most wonderful time of the year, as the songwriter said. You know, so many memories, so enjoyable. Um, so many songs about Jesus. I, I, love, I love it when I'm in a store. And some of these songs, folks, really have the gospel message in it. It's the Christmas songs. And I love being in, like, Walmart. I'm like, are you guys hearing this song right now? It's like, I want to just start preaching, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, part of it kind of breaks my heart when you think about some of these famous singers that are singing some of these songs. But it's like, are you listening to what you're singing? You know, you're declaring that God is using a donkey to, to share the gospel right now, you know. Uh, Balaam's donkey preaching at the preacher. And, um, uh, but they're out there. What are they doing? They're, 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 they're singing these songs about, about this Messiah, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, you know. Um, o come now. By the way, that one, that, that song in particular is packed with scripture. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you think about these songs, saving people. Uh, I'm trying to think. There's, there's one in particular. I can't remember the line. But we'll move on. Um, but, you know, the, the big thing with all the traditions and sweets, you know, there's really there's many opportunities to share our faith. And that's, that's the one thing that I love about this. You know, when we look at it and, you know, realize all these things line up, but, but what a tremendous opportunity to share, to share your faith with others. Again, Jesus is the reason for this season, but what's the reason for Jesus? Um, that's actually uh, what I laid out on our door hangers that should be here this week. Um, I put the gospel on the back, and that's what I started out with. Um, Jesus is the reason for the season, but what's the reason for Jesus? And I kind of start approaching the gospel from that angle and that perspective, that, um, that Christ came to save sinners. And, uh, and what an important uh, truth that is, an opportunity to share. It's not just about, oh, that's neat, a baby that was born in a manger. You know? I mean, if you ask, uh, I, I don't understand what lost people are celebrating this time of year, even if they're aware of, of a baby being born. Um, folks, this is a miraculous birth. And let me just say this. I know some Bible translations say, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son. There's nothing amazing. There's nothing unusual about that. Um, but I'll tell you what, a virgin? Uh, that's a one-time-in-history kind of a thing, you see, a virgin conceiving and bearing a son. And, um, and uh, what, a, what an awesome thought that Jesus came into this world without the Adamic blood flowing through his veins uh, to die for the sins of mankind. He was pure, spotless, the Son of God, and he came to die for the sins of mankind. And so when we think about the Christmas season, the big thing I want to say is, I know it's cliche, but keep Christ in Christmas. We keep it about Christ. Keep your pockets loaded up with gospel tracts. There's so many opportunities, you know, uh, standing in line and uh, someone singing along with the Christmas song that's going on. You know what the song's about? I know there's a lot of songs, you know, Rudolph the Red Nose Ranger. There's no really redeeming gospel message in that song. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, there are some songs you might hear, and what a great opportunity, you know. You're, you're, kill, you're killing time in the Costco line, and, and you're like, you know, you know what this song's about? This is an amazing song. Let me tell you the story. I, I was just thinking about this song, and, and, uh, and boom, you just go right into the gospel. Um, again, just some, some wonderful times. Um, I like what one person said. By the way, you ought to look for someone who you can share the Christmas message with. I like what one person said. He said, you cannot take the gospel to the wrong address. And truly, you can't. 
How many of you have ever uh, shared the gospel with somebody and found out they were already a Christian? It's funny what happens with that, especially if you're just knocking on someone's door. Some Christians get very convicted because they're like, you know, I know I should be doing something like this. Some will get upset. Can you imagine getting upset with somebody trying to share the gospel with you? Hopefully that will come back and cause them to think, why did I get upset about that? You see? And some are like, you know what, this is awesome what you're doing. I, I ought to do something like this. Um, but you can't take the gospel to the wrong address. Who knows? You just might be prompting another Christian to do right, and you might be bringing a lost person to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, of course, that is our prayer. That is why we are here. And, um, and uh, I do love this time of year. Um, any, any questions? I know I didn't go th- like exhaustively through maybe some of the Christmas traditions or anything. And, and by the way, there are some of those traditions. It doesn't have to be spiritual. I'll tell you what, there's nothing spiritual about fudge, but I'm going to eat my fudge, okay? And I'm going to enjoy it, and my diet starts the first of the year, amen? Um, but, uh, but, you know, what an enjoyable time. And, uh, again, these songs, the opportunity to share the gospel. There are going to be those in our community that are the two times a year churchgoers. And, uh, and we need to be ready, and I want them to know we're here and, uh, and that we love them. And who knows, it just might be. That, uh, that they get saved and, uh, and God connects them with the church family and they start growing. And, uh, and that is, uh, again, our desire. And so, wonderful time. Be praying about opportunities um, this, uh, this Christmas season. Uh, I only have a word of prayer.